have any swimmers in here tonight? Anybody that likes to swim? I'm not trying to ask about your prowess or anything like that. Just do you like to swim? Looks like we're maybe 50, 50 maybe, something like that. I didn't try to, I'm not good with math, so my percentages, 30% of percentages are wrong anyway. But I saw somebody recently say that swimming is about the only cardio, you know, cardio activity that can actually be fun. Anybody agree with that? Amen? Okay, I got a few, a few more there. Florence is her name. If you're taking notes tonight and you want to write down, you're the kind that likes to write down all, everything, you might put Florence somewhere near the introduction-ish area of the handout or your own notes. Florence Chadwick is her name. She lived in the early 20th century. She had always wanted to be a swimmer. It was her lifelong, from as early as she could remember, she had dreamed of being a speed swimmer. Not just a swimmer, but a speed swimmer. So at age six, she talks her parents into letting her swim a 50-feet race. And she comes in last place, six years old. She keeps training. Every day, she trains. And so at age 11, she competes in an endurance race, six miles long. And she wins. She gained a little fame, a little attention after that. But she didn't want to do that. She wanted to be a speed swimmer. So she trains some more, and at age 14, she enters the National Backstroke Championship and comes in second. Then four years later, now at age 18, she tries out for the Olympic team. She comes in fourth place, and the only the top three made the U.S. Olympic team. So what does she do? Florence quits. She gives up. Dream over. She gets married, moves on to other interests. Her life goes on. But then, a few years after that, she gets to thinking, what if she had focused on endurance swimming instead of that goal of being a speed swimmer? So 12 years after she failed to make the Olympic team for speed swimming, she breaks at that time the 24-year record for swimming across the English Channel. The previous female held record. What did she do? There's two things that happened to Florence Chadwick. One, she gave up. Especially for our task tonight, she lost hope. Dream lost. But then the second thing she did over a decade later after she gave up was her hope renewed. She regained her hope and went on to do some pretty spectacular things because she gained her hope back. Enduring hope. That is specifically our task for the evening. We're going to be in the letter we call 1 Thessalonians mostly tonight so yeah you might want to go ahead and make your way on over there and we'll see what happens okay Ray's giving me some sign language back there all right I think he probably did that but yeah I don't know that I'm gonna be able to do anything okay we'll, we'll just see what happens all right fingers crossed endurance endurance just like Florence Do you have hope tonight? If we had to put tonight's lesson into, into a pivotal question, it would be that one. Do you have it tonight? Hope is wired into our DNA, it seems. It's a part of the fabric of how God created us as human beings. It is human to hope, or at least it is human to want something to hope, to look for hope. We're always searching for a reason to get up every morning. Or if we have A or reasons, we tend to keep searching for a better reason. So maybe we get up earlier, we don't hit the snooze as much, or we look forward to something that's ahead. Our lives tend to be shaped by hope. 
We have an object for our hopes. We hope for something. We hope in something. And therefore, there's also something that holds up or supports whatever we're hoping in or hoping for. And then when that support fails us, when the bridge falls, we don't fare so well. And our hopes are dashed. How do you keep on? It might be in a a relationship, as we discussed some this morning. It might be in a service, a ministry, or your job, or whatever it is. I'm not telling you tonight you can't get a different job. That's beside the point. But how do you keep on? How do you not give up when the honeymoon is over, whether literally or metaphorically, when the shine of what was fresh and exciting, when that has dulled? How do you keep going day after day, month after month, not only when maybe the, the shine is gone, but when the shine is turned into stress, when it's miserable to keep on in the moment at least. When life gets messy and life gets mean, how do you keep on? How do you keep going? God, thankfully, offers us as his people He's offered when we became a part of his family and he keeps on offering us a hope. But that hope is a package deal. It comes with endurance. God offers us hope tonight even that gives us endurance. Gives us that strength to keep on keeping on. Or to not quit. And that is certainly the case when it comes to running or finishing the Christian life, I guess we could say race, swim, if you want to keep that going. Just two things for tonight. First, the strength in our hope, that endurance, that power. And then, overlapping with that, the source of that hope. Or you might also look at source tonight as more about what the hope actually is. So here's what the hope does for me. Here's the actual object or identity of what I'm I'm hoping for or the source of hope. Let's look together at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 as we first then look at the strength of our hope. That's not the end of Florence's story. As we're turning to 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, and 3, where Paul uses a phrase, steadfast hope, or a hope of endurance. Not the end for Florence. A few years after, she becomes the first, per- first female person to ever swim both directions of the English Channel. She doesn't just break the record one way, she, she makes a new one. She decides to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast. That particular day, it's foggy, dense fog. She's 15 hours in, in the water, 15 hours. And then she can't see anything. So she gave up again. As she's visiting with the reporters, she says, not that I'm trying to excuse myself, but if I could have seen the land, I think I might could have made it. So she tries it again. Guess what happens? She's a few hours in, and in rolls the dim spot. But she makes it this time. Because she kept telling herself, even though I can't see it, the land is out there. You just got to keep on swimming. For people who are living in a dense fog of paganism, of suffering, of persecution, and they're barely in. They might not even be 15 hours in. There may be a year or so into this thing called Christianity. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 and 3. After the, the initial greeting, he says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. By the way, this prayer that starts right here, to some degree will continue to almost the end of chapter 3 when you get another prayer. And then he, he kind of moves on into chapter 4. But it's this prayer and the sharing of their, relation, their ministry 
background where Paul had been there. Now he's writing back to them. He says, we give thanks, remembering before God, verse 3 says, our, before God, our, fa- our God and Father, your work of love, a work of faith, love's coming. Okay, I have the tree on my head. And labor of love, you see that faith, love. There's another passage that's more familiar to us that's faith, hope, and love. This one just rearranges the three. That trio is found several times in the New Testament scriptures. But here it is, the work of faith, the labor of love, and then there's our phrase tonight, the steadfastness of hope. In, and here we're going to get a little ahead of ourselves, hint, hint, in, source, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope and endurance. In general, say Florence Chadwick, or whatever it is you're involved in, if you can see even just mentally, you may not always be able to see it right in front of you. That's kind of why it's called hope. It hasn't happened yet, but it has this way of producing within our, our souls, within our lives, this vigor, this energy, this ability to, as we said, when we might be tempted to give in and give up, to just throw in the towel to keep on. And for us, that's a general principle of life. But it is extra, extra true for the Christian. Because of our hope, and because of the direct connection between hope in Jesus and the life for Jesus, that's why we need endurance to keep living that life, to not get lazy or complacent. There's a direct connection between those two that pushes us forward to keep serving, keep living, keep obeying Him, the one He calls our Lord, Jesus Christ. So in your mind tonight, hold those two, hope and endurance, or steadfastness. Hold them right there in your mind. For a moment, let's bring a couple other verses alongside. We're going to read Hebrews 12 together. I'll let you take a look on your own at 1 Corinthians 15. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, just the first two verses. Keep in mind as you read 1 Corinthians 15, 58, you might want to read the whole chapter. That's part of why we're not going to do that tonight in this time. But in Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2, after in a similar way, it's a different discussion, but a a similar situation where you've got a, a chapter filled with these examples in Hebrews 11 of people of faith, people of hope, people who died before they saw their hope fulfilled. Then we read this call. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, also of our hope, who for the joy that was set before him, what does that sound like to you? A joy set before him, endured, and this endurance isn't just, I keep doing what I'm doing, this is enduring pain. Or as he puts it here, he endured the cross, despising the shame, then, this is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When it comes to trying to stay faithful and committed, the reason we can do that is because of our hope, an enduring hope that gives us the strength to keep on. Now go back with me now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's pick up where we left off at verse 4. I put these three words together because they seem to be about the best way to summarize 4 through 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Gospel, affliction, and testimony. They were who they were because of the gospel. 
But then they've been going through some difficulties. But they've made such an impression. Have you ever been there where maybe it's a movie? Maybe it's the, the recent movie that everybody's talking about right now where you, you see them, you run into them, and it's like one of the things they, they have to tell you at the beginning of the conversation. You know, if they didn't really like the movie, it might come up in conversation, but it's not a big deal. These Christians made such an impact on other people that Paul was hearing about it in a big way. Well, I'll, I'll be quiet and let the text speak of the rest for us tonight. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4, he says, For we know, brothers, Love by God that he has chosen you because our gospel, there's that word, came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And then verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. When I read that, I can't help but think back to endurance of hope in the previous couple of verses and what we read a moment ago in Hebrews 12, that one of the ways they were imitating Jesus was because of their enduring hope. But he says you became imitators of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example, testimony, to all the believers. And he names two relatively large areas. It's not like he writes to second in Adams and he says people in Elk City have heard about you it's more like people in Beckham County and a few other counties people in western Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle maybe even up to Kansas maybe even those people down in North Texas close to that Dallas area they've heard about you what would that be like and I don't know if you went to some of those places and you asked them have you heard about the Church of Christ in Elk City you might have to ask quite a few people. I mean, you'd eventually run into somebody, because I've, I've had that happen before, but it wouldn't necessarily be statistically the first person you see at the gas station. Although I have done that in towns before. You go and you just say, hey, what do you know about the Church of Christ here? They made this impact. And then through verse 8, he says, they themselves, verse 8, report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God. I'm at verse 9, I'm sorry. We're coming to verse 9, all right? Verse 8 continues and says, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Now, Paul's going to say some things. He's going to finish this letter and he's going to write a second letter to them, but that's how their testimony had spread. Why? Well, it goes back to that trio in verse 3. So one out of three, at least, of why they made this impact was because of their hope that gave them endurance. That is the strength of hope. Let's consider now together the source. To do this, we're going to finish this chapter and then, in a very overview fashion, finish the letter. Don't get too nervous. I said overview. I said very overview. Okay? Let's read those last two verses now. We already started verse 9, but we're going to do it again just because it's supposed to be that way. Our, the source of our hope and what our hope is, it looks like these four words or these three words, wait for Jesus. Let's read it, verses 9 and 10. It says, They report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols, unheard of in this part of the world, at this time in the world. You turn from idols to God to serve the living and true God. This is a really concise but really accurate way to describe conversion. But now that I'm converted to Christ, part of what I do is wait. <laughs> Isn't that enticing? Or you're, a, you're a Christian now, guess what? Get ready to wait. Not that there's not some great things in the present. And our hope, part of why it's so great, is it comes to meet us, it comes to greet us from afar in the present. But he says this in verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven. He's coming back one day. Whom he raised from the dead, he died, but he lives now. Who is this? 
This is Jesus, who he says delivers us from the wrath to come. He's coming back, and because he is so loving and good, he also gets angry. And one day, wrath is coming. But part of our hope is seeing Jesus and being delivered by Jesus. That's where our hope comes from. It comes from waiting for Jesus to come get us. But let's keep going. Next chapter. And if you follow tonight, you might notice something, a pattern here when it comes to the chapters in 1 Thessalonians. But chapter 2, we're going to drop toward the end now, verses 17 through 20, with the key word glory. Glory. Our hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, he says, Since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because he wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan, like Satan, hindered us. And then the hope part, verse 19 and 20. Because of how much Paul cherished these Christians and wanted to see them again, it wasn't just about this life. And he's realizing in this life, there, there's some things you can hope that will happen, but no guarantees. Satan is there for one thing. But then he asks these questions. He says, what is our hope? Or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming, we're there again, hope. Is it not you? Now this isn't to diminish from Paul's hope of seeing Jesus and other things, but for this context, he's centered in on their connection, their love. I want to see you. I don't just want to see you in Thessalonica. I want to see you when Jesus comes back. And that's part of why I have glory, and even he calls it boasting here before him, is you and the role that I play in you being that now, you might not be someone that has taught or will teach a lot of people in a, in a major way like Paul but what will it be like however large however small the influence and the impact that you have and will have on other people's lives from the person married to you to your kids to your friends there's something to hope for what about those that have passed on I want to see them again so we come to chapter 3. There's glory, and then there's security. Same thing with chapter 3, the last few verses. Here's another prayer of Paul that he shares with us through inspiration. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 through 13 now. There's a few other passages tagged on here that also revolve around the idea of security in our hope. Because the source is a God who works in us and a God who establishes us for that hope. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 through 13, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. There's that again. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father, at the coming, how many times is Paul going to use those two words, the coming, or the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints? That's what I'm hoping for. That's what we're hoping for, isn't it? Jesus. And part of why that hope is can be solid, settled. I don't have to doubt it. I don't have to wonder. Because God is a powerful God. And he's also a gracious God. Before we look at the last two chapters, flip over to 2 Thessalonians. And we'll just read this one for a cross-reference here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I believe your handout has three. I caught the typo in time to fix the PowerPoint, but... You're on your own. Good luck with the handout. But it is supposed to, supposed, supposed to be chapter 3, or chapter 2. See? You see why I put 3 on the handout? Now you know. 
it is supposed to be chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2, these last two verses of the chapter. He says, now, in the language, it's another prayer. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, notice it's just flipped here. Is who loved us and gave us eternal comfort. Wow. And good hope. Good hope. Through grace. May he comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. Just because he works in you and he's gracious doesn't mean you need to be lazy now. And I said we'd just read it. Oh well, too bad. And word. So when he writes to them again, there's a similar note playing in this letter in 2 Thessalonians. Let's go back now to 1 Thessalonians. Where were we? I think we're ready for chapter 4. And no, we're not going to read all of this one either. But let's note the two verses in this section. They're almost the first verse and the last verse. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11, or 13 through chapter 5, verse 11. There's two verses here that mention our, one of our key words, hope. Coming is in there too, if you look. Look at verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. What was that pivotal question? Do you have hope? Some people don't. What do they do? Ever ask that question? I've had conversations with some of you in this room about that. What, what do you do? How, how do you get through some of these things like this? Some don't. There's been some scientific medical studies done about what happens even to our physiology when we reach that point of despair where we lose all but the point is that we don't have to be that way. You've got to keep reading. Then you come to verse 8 of chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. This trio of faith, hope, and love meets us again in these verses. He says, since we belong to the day, 5, 8, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope, of salvation. So there are some that have no hope. You don't have to be that way. Even for those that have died in Jesus, you're going to see them again with Jesus. Resurrection Day. Chapter 5 continues that. His coming, yes, to punish those that fell asleep spiritually. But as for us, we have something to put on our heads that guards us from anxiety and Despair, not that we're not going to have anxieties, but if we're willing, we can put on a helmet to carry us through, through the struggles, through the worries, to the day when Jesus comes back again. That's why he says in verse 11 and in verse 18 of these two chapters, 418, 511, what are we supposed to do in the meantime for one another? Encourage one another. Encourage. It was on the screen. Let's do chapter 5, 23 and 24. We've already seen chapter 5. It's a good way to begin to wrap things up for the evening. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. He says, Now, oh, now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then don't miss this next verse. This might be one we should pound into our heads or put on the refrigerator. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He's going to come back. And he's going to be there to keep you. Now you got some keeping on to do yourself. It's like you're holding hands with Jesus and he's keeping you on his part. You better keep holding on on yours. And he 
going to come back. Thus tonight, we see the strength in our hope. We also see the source of our hope. It is a Savior like none other. It is a God who keeps us and a God who delivers us from the wrath to come. God offers us a hope that gives endurance. Do you have hope? Before Shane comes and leads us, I'll share this with you. If you're not a Christian tonight, and I don't say that to be trivial or trovial, I I say that to say that, why not? I know this is a Sunday night crowd, and most everyone in here of an appropriate age is a Christian. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean that I I don't have my issues, my doubts. I don't have my times when maybe maybe I'm I'm a little hopeless. Tonight's lesson is not really one of those that says you better do better as a Christian. And there's some place a place for some sermons like that. Tonight's more simple don't don't let satan hinder you so much you give in keep on there's hope but here's something about our hope you have something profoundly deeper to hold on to than hope that people will be nice to you that your job will work out that you will make good choices when tempted that you'll be smart enough to make good decisions that you'll be able to avoid poverty or sickness or you'll have a good place to live and enough to eat No, this is eternal and deeply personal hope. It rests in the truth that Jesus has wrapped his powerful arms around you and he will never let you go. If nothing you envisioned ever works out and all the bad things that you've dreaded come your way, you still have hope because he is with you in power, and in grace. There's a portrait of a mountain shack burned to the crisp, burned to the ground. Nothing left. And there in the painting, at standing in front of what used to be the front yard of this house, is what looks like a grandpa, it's an older gentleman, and a little boy, about five. Maybe he's an older parent, but that that also is beside the the picture. He's standing there, looking on. And through the years, as the story has been told about this painting, the caption that has been given, as if below the picture, as if reading the image of the two staring on, are these words. Hush, my child. God ain't dead. Hush. God, our God, is alive. And to borrow from Conway, not Kanye, remember that in the winter, in life's winters, far beneath the bitter snow. There lies the seed of hope that with the son's love and this part ain't Conway with the S-O-N son's love becomes the rose. Let's stand and sing together.